Thank you, Wilsden Seventh Day Adventist Virtual Praise Team, for that rendition and inspiring message in song. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. The song to most of us reminds us of Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, where the clarion call says, Arise, shine. Two reasons are given. Number one, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. But also on a somber mood, arise and shine. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross dark the people. Indeed, COVID-19 pandemic may have covered a people with its gross darkness. But not only is the Old Testament making that clear and call, but also the call and affirmation comes from the New Testament, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, let your light so shine that others may see and appreciate the glory of the Lord. Once again, thank you, Wilsden Praise Team. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel Osei, our South England Conference President, for your kind and noble words of introduction. It is always a privilege to serve the Lord for his people. And I thank you for that opportunity. In fact, if I may just mention that your role in facilitating this presentation uh, today for it to take place is very much appreciated. I would also like to recognize with gratitude the part played by the South England Conference media and communications personnel. And to each one of you, uh, we indeed truly applaud your devotion and support. And to our audience today from those from the UK and those joining us from around the world, wherever you are. We in the South England Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists would like to acknowledge your being part of our audience uh, today. Let me invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you, Lord, for ministering to each one of us. We invite you in a special way, therefore, not only wherever we are, but in our hearts. Guide and lead. May your Holy Spirit impress upon our hearts and minds to always serve you are right and be a beacon of light in this day and age, we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Coronavirus mandatory vaccination update, as we called it. Liberty of conscience and the law. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, the Coronavirus Act 2020, while the COVID-19 virus to many remains a big issue, the main challenge. But we see yet to others, they perceive the purported manner 
in which it will be administered, apparently by force or compulsory, is to them not only a big issue, but the real issue. Uh, this is clearly exemplified uh, from one of my callers uh, who said, Pastor, I don't know what to make of this anymore. I said, of what? Well, Pastor, during this coronavirus pandemic or scandemic or pandemic, I don't know what to call it anymore. I was ordered to quarantine and isolate myself. I did. Put on my first mask. On, I did. Then, wash my hands, apply the sanitizer, and practice social distancing. I did. Pastor, what is this I'm now hearing? I said, hearing of what? Well, that I will be forcibly vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine against the wishes and of not wanting to have it. Then I said to the individual, who said that to you? You will be vaccinated against the liberty of your conscience. The individual went quiet. And uh, for a moment, I realized that this individual, as many others, were privy to two videos. These videos both purported that on the 27th of April, 2020, laws had been changed in the UK and that from that date, COVID-19 vaccine would be given by force. Uh, you will recall also in the last two presentations, uh, we brought to your attention, those of you in the UK uh, who attended these presentations, uh, that uh, that allegation was not true. Uh, we investigated carefully. I would like at this point to recommend to you uh, one of our directors in the South England Conference, Pastor Sam Davies. Uh, he has written an article that I would like to recommend highly, uh, where he outlines the dangers of not heeding three basic things when it comes to social media. To ignore, number one, to verify, number two, to verify, number three, to verify the information you are receiving. When we looked at the two videos I referred to earlier, uh, we made it our point to consider checking with the government. Was that so that a law had been enacted on the 27th of April this year that individuals will be forcibly vaccinated, uh, that information uh, was not true. But we even went further to make sure uh, that we also sought uh, the comments uh, of the legal um, advisors. And fortunately, we had, on the 1st of May, 2020, Louise Hooper, a barrister, who had written 
an article entitled Coronavirus Act 2020. Does it permit mandatory vaccinations? On it, Louise Hooper of Garden Court Chambers explains that social media concerns that changes to the law mean that the government has the power to force vaccines or other medication on you are wrong and unfounded. Obit, she went on, there are multiple human rights and civil liberties implications, both globally and domestically arising from the response to COVID-19 and the current crisis. Some of them are very real and some concerning. Others are scaremongering and simply not true. Her advice was taken by the South England Conference Public Affairs and Religious Liberty as something worth following. Not only checking uh, with the social media, uh, but also being mindful uh, that the human rights and civil liberties are gu safely guarded, as it were. It was also her conclusion uh, where she emphasized the point. It is clear that mandatory medical treatment and vaccination are explicitly prohibited by the act. There is, however, potential for abuse leading to infringement of civil liberties and human rights unless the powers contained in the Coronavirus Act are exercised lawfully. The YouTube video that I had uh, referred to you earlier, whilst correctly identifying some of the powers above, failed to refer at all to the limitations on those powers. However, her marked conclusion was, as with any legislation dramatically affecting civil liberties, there is a need for vigilance to ensure the state does not overstep its boundaries and an effective remedy when it does so. There was a great need uh, for the South England Conference uh, to remain vigilant, not only giving advice for those who are being misled on the social media, but to follow through any changes in the legislation. It was for that reason when the UK Parliament Human Rights Joint Select Committee uh, put forward a call for evidence to the public to respond to the government's response to COVID-19 human rights uh, implications uh, during this pandemic uh, period. Uh, they raised three areas, and these were, number one, what steps need to be taken to ensure that measures taken by the government to address the COVID-19 pandemic are human rights compliant? Secondly, what will the impact of specific measures taken by the government to address the COVID-19 pandemic be on human rights in the UK? Thirdly, what groups will be disproportionately affected by measures taken by the government to address the COVID-19 pandemic. The South England Conference uh, took uh, the first uh, uh, key uh, area uh, because having listened 
not only to our members, uh, but to the public. Many during uh, this pandemic period were concerned with the issue of mandatory vaccination. Uh, this issue seemed not to go away. It became a major talking point. So we decided uh, to respond uh, to this uh, call for evidence. With that in mind, uh, we entitled um, our presentation, UK COVID-19 Vaccination Human Rights Compliance, Compulsory or Consensual. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Joint Committee, Committee said, if the piece of work an individual or an organization provides, that will be received seriously uh, to contribute towards giving guidance, it will be uh, put uh, on their website in the House of Parliament. Uh, we just want to thank God that the South England Conference, 150,000 words piece, um, is now uh, in the House of Parliament, as it were, uh, as you can see there, it has its own code, COVO 174. In a nutshell, what we attempted to raise uh, was that uh, the idea of uh, mandatory vaccination uh, was one in which uh, was, had no simple answers, as it were. Uh, we needed to command that the government strikes a balance, particularly taking note of individuals' liberty of conscience, to do so or not to do so. Uh, we are grateful to God uh, as a matter of fact, if I may add that if some of you have not read it yet, please do so. Uh, you, I'm so glad that the Messenger magazine has published it, the, our, recent, uh, our recent magazine. Uh, you can also find it uh, on the South England Conference website, but also in the UK House of Parliament website. Of course, that said, uh, this brings me to our presen presentation, uh, which we intended today was to accommodate those who regrettably were unable to join us at our last, at our last uh, re uh, presentation because uh, we were oversubscribed and uh, if I may take this opportunity to say sorry, uh, we do apologize for all those who couldn't come in. But as most of you would have known or heard, that now the government, the UK government that is, in the last couple of days has published an open consultation. Most of us, and indeed, some of you out there felt that this uh, was a matter of agency and it should be addressed uh, today for reasons I'm going to uh, let you know. So there's been a slight change uh, to what we had intended it today as it were. Um, I remember speaking uh, with the president, Dr. Emmanuel Ose, as we followed the whole issue of mandatory vaccination 
and other issues that we envisaged there was going to be a snap consultation by the government. But little did we realize how soon. We are now in the UK playing once again catch up. I would like us to address this consultation, uh, particularly for the audience uh, in UK. That document has just been pub published by the Department of Health and Social Care. An open consultation merely means the government is consulting the public to respond with their views to something they are about to do for them. And I like that kind of democratic privilege because other countries will just say, take it or leave it, you're going to have it. But here, you and I are being consulted. If you follow the consultation document, what is it? It will bring changes to human medicine regulations to support the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. This document, this consultation was published on the 28th of August 2020, approximately 10 days ago, 10 days ago. I would like us to be very careful. I'll, let me say outright, for those of us, the moment you, say, you see roll out of COVID-19 vaccines, oh, mandatory vaccination is here. No, 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 no. Uh, we will be wise and harmless and measured. If you follow, it says the changes will have to do not of mandatory or compulsory vaccination, but dealing with human medicine, which must be regulated to support the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. Further, the document that is online, you can access that document yourself. It goes on to say, this has something to do with distributing, not vaccinating you yet, distributing vaccines and treatments for COVID-19 and flu. Orbit published on the 28th of August, 2020. If you see at the bottom, it tells you it will close on the 18th of September, 2020 at 11.59. What that means, unlike most, let me emphasize, most of the consultations where you have a minimum of three months, two or three months for the public to respond, this one, which directly affects you as you will see, you will have to respond in three weeks or thereabout. In summary, let us find out exactly what is it that the government is trying to accomplish or to get out from you in three weeks. The document says, we want your views 
on proposed changes to the human medicine regulations to help with the safe and efficient distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine and expanded flu vaccine program in the UK, along with treatments for COVID-19 and any other diseases that become pandemic. If I go one step further, really, uh, I'm saying to myself three weeks, why such rush? And to me, possibly to many others, I've heard a short notice. On the same document, what you have there is from the consultation document. It says timing. At the time of publication of this document, it is not clear what the earliest date is that it might be possible to deploy a COVID-19 vaccine in the UK. In the circumstances, the UK government is moving as quickly, mark that they are now in a fast lane. They are moving, it says, quickly as possible to put in place a package of legislative measures that would support the delivery or a safe and effective vaccine for whenever the measures are needed. And further, they provide, in the same document, consultation description. Who are taking a lead on this? Obviously from the Department of Health and Social Care. It says here, the UK government with the Minister of Health in Northern Ireland is seeking views on proposed changes to Human Medicine Regulations 2012. That is something you should put your eye on, your mind on, because they are giving you a clue of what changes are in that regulation of 2012 to what it will look like in 2020. Therefore, in that document, they tell you what the areas cover. There are about five of them. Authorizing temporary supply of an licensed product. Hmm, I thought everything should be licensed. Well, they are seeking your view on authorizing temporary supply of unlicensed product. Civil liability and immunity. Expanding the workforce eligible to administer vaccinations promoting vaccines, making provisions for wholesale dealing of vaccines. To the audience, particularly those of us in UK directly affected, those five points are well laid out in detail. Let me beg of you. First and foremost, that as many of our members and the public have an access to this document, go through those five points. Bit lengthy, but very apt at a time like this. For this consultation, albeit being moved quickly, uh, will be a deciding factor, in my opinion, to what may happen 
to you and to me. May I emphasize, there is no direct, as it were, mention of vaccine by mandation. But I'm saying also, let this be an opportunity for you to take part. And as we do so, we will be respectful, we will be measured, we will seek to put across, and for those of us uh, who love the Lord and are guided by the Spirit of the Lord, that we will be measured in our response, as it were. If I may just take you to give you some guidance, that these changes had to have to do with the human medicines regulations of 2012. So you cannot just ignore that phrase. It's giving you some kind of lead to what you should look for. So what you do, um, let me just read again, the UK government with the Minister of Health in Northern Ireland is seeking views on proposed changes to the Human Medicine Regulations 2012. Those regulations uh, may be uh, tweaked or expanded. So what you do, you quickly go back to 2012 regulations. What did they entail? Let me read to you at the bottom. It says the 2012 regulations set out a comprehensive regime for the authorization of medicinal products for human use, for the manufacture, import, distribution, sale, and supply of those products, for their labeling and advertising, and for pharmacovigilance. That is what it regulated on human medicines, as it were. Then you say, where did it stem from? Because a regulation is a step from a particular act of parliament. Well, 1968 Medicines Act, there you have it, regulates the licensing, supply, and administration of medicines. So you will see that the regulation expanded on that act. The 1968 Medicines Act was expanded by the Human Medicines Regulation 2012, as it were. But when you look at the act, it says the act had to do with prescription-only medicines. Listen, prescription-only medicines can only be given in accordance with the directions of an appropriate practitioner. Appropriate practitioner. My brothers, my friends, my listeners, take note of that. Will the human medicines regulation of 2020 Follow that or it will be expanded to something else which you must raise as an issue to you. Uh, the document, let me go quickly. Uh, here it says the uh, high levels, nature of proposals. Uh, really that paragraph just tells you that uh, all these regulations are to help uh, the NHS in each of the four nations uh, of the UK, that is England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. It says, as they decide the best way to roll out COVID-19 vaccination program in each nation, as they do for their national flu vaccination programs, and would do for any future national distribution 
campaign for treatments for a pandemic disease. So this is a, an overall, apparently, a regulatory instrument uh, which will be uh, deployed uh, in each uh, region, as it were, or country. Something that I want you to take note, uh, possibly it's also revealing from the document, it says, what this consultation exercise is definitely not about, is not about who would or would not be vaccinated as part of a COVID-19 or flu vaccine program or how the NHS in each UK nation will commission or run it. For example, just because one UK nation might want to train student nurses and doctors to administer COVID-19 vaccines or flu vaccines, that does not mean another UK nation would also want to do it. What the proposals do is to give them all the option of doing so within a clear and supportive legal framework should they want to use it. Okay. Now, if, and that is if, the regulation that is being aimed goes through, it will look like something you are seeing there. The human medicines coronavirus, in brackets, amend amendment regulations 2020. And also what is revealing, you'll see at the bottom there, uh, it will be laid before parliament 2020. 20, coming into force October 2020. So you and I don't have much time to think uh, the 18th of September is far away. They are in a fast lane. This must be brought through Parliament and it must come into force and ratified supposedly in October this year, next month, if you please. This is one of the citations uh, that uh, uh, come from the instrument itself. But an amendment of Regulation 8 uh, from the previous one, it will look something different I thought of bringing this one to you, uh, that in terms of those who will be regulating or applying the coronavirus uh, to individuals will include a registered nurse, a registered midwife, a registered nursing associate, an operating department practitioner, a paramedic, a physiotherapist registered, a health and care professions council registered, a pharmacy, a pharmacist. Uh, something possibly for those of you who are in the medical field, uh, you may want to have a, a look at it. There is plenty, I just wanted to highlight a few things. Then you will come in the document which says, responding to this consultation, taking into account the information in this document, some areas I have raised with you. They repeat, the consultation period will run until end of Friday, 18th September 2020. Ways to respond online. After reading the document, that's when you start in earnest. As soon as you press respond online, it will let you in. Department of Health and Social Care, distributing vaccines and treatments to COVID-19 and flu. 
they are welcoming you. That's where you start. I'll be brief to the point. As soon as you get in, you have to go through and out. If you return, you will lose. You can't come in. If you go through having not read the document and you come up with some ideas after, you can't come in. So what is important? Read through, have your responses read as it were. Then it tells you to go forward. And those are uh, you'll find there responding to this con consultation. They remind you a few other things you have to bear in mind. Next, you give your own details, uh, your address, who you are, and uh, uh, if you'd like to uh, be contacted, uh, if ever they may want to follow through, then you continue. When you come to the page that you are seeing now, uh, it will ask you, are you responding to this as an individual or representing an organization? Please don't be put off. Uh, do either. You can respond on your own. We have done these things before, nothing wrong. Or you may prefer to uh, represent your organization, of course, uh, through uh, the um, admittance and acceptance of those in authority, you may do so. Then the next page you are seeing inside it, it will <clears throat> ask you which area of the five you read in their document would you like to respond? You'll see them inside there. They are reminding you there are one, two, three, four, five. Well defined as it were. So if you is they're asking you if you want to answer all, please go ahead and do so. But you may choose just to answer one or two, uh, but as long as you respond, uh, giving your own views, as it were. And then they provide a section which says, please provide comments on areas of changes proposed by them, but those comments given by you uh, uh, below. So on that page, uh, you'll be given. Uh, if I may add that uh, possibly I was hurrying when I went in, I was not able to find the actual uh, location where to put my answers, but I want to believe uh, you will find it. Uh, but if not, uh, we may have to uh, raise um, uh, this as an area that must be looked into. But then go forward. Then it will just tell you the last uh, protocols uh, to bear in mind. And then you, are, you come to the very end, as it were. Then they will tell you, thank you for your response. Um, and then you await uh, to hear uh, what the response will be like. As I conclude, uh, the principle that has guided us in the South England Conference has been Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, especially during this pandemic period. Uh, we see COVID-19 as a challenge, but also providing us an opportunity. Jesus speaking to his disciples then, is talking to us as his disciples today. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Um, Jesus realized there will be times in the future where his people, his followers, will find themselves in circumstances that are challenging. Uh, he expected them not to run away from
from the challenge or to fight that challenge in their strength. But having found themselves in that situation, to be wise and to be harmless. Sheep bleed. That's the sound they make. But something about sheep also, they just want to remain in their bubble. Not wanting, not wanting to be disturbed. Possibly as a church for far too long, we have been really contented in our bubble. Jesus commissioned his disciples to leave their bubble and find themselves where the wolves are where the challenge is. I want to believe that God could also have allowed the challenges we are facing today to provide us an opportunity to witness for him in unlikely places, in an unlikely manner that we have hitherto possibly done. You will find yourselves surrounded with wolves. The obvious thing is a fight or flight mechanism approach. Don't do either. But be wise and be harmless. Yes, the sheep must be assertive without being aggressive. As we will be responding to the consultation, as our response, as we see the situation evolve, not only in UK, let me speak to the audience outside of UK. I don't know how your governments are regulating COVID-19 but it is pandemic. It is worldwide, not localized. I'm appealing to Seventh-day Adventists, as I'm appealing to my own heart that we be wise and harmless, that God would be allowing this to give us an opportunity not only to witness for him but to build our own characters as we'll be facing even more hard issues ahead of us, more than COVID-19. Indeed, Jesus telling his disciples, you'll be brought before governors and kings, but because I've sent you the challenges you will meet, it will be for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So you're going out to challenging places. It's Jesus sending you there. If you ask, it says, oh, what and how will I manage to deal with issues that are not part of my belief? Part of my conscience, Jesus says, I created both the sheep and the wolf. Be reminded. I know how to deal with the situation. No wonder in verse 20, Jesus says, For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. I'm asking, don't be afraid of the consultation document. How you respond, what you respond, just be wise and harmless and let the spirit of your father speak through you to the government. You will find it challenging. For, for, because I've come to realize 
there will be bigger issues ahead, as I've noted. If we can't deal with the coronavirus and the legislations that are taking place, we, I, I can't assure you it may, it may not be mandatory. At the moment, it is not. But you don't conspire, you don't com begin to talk the future now. You have to be wise and harmless. Let me tell you, for if we cannot run with the footmen, <clears throat> if we can't grapple with COVID-19 now, how will we run with the horses? Possibly of Sunday legislation. Could this be a pre-run, please? I'm just putting that to you. This is not meant to frighten us, to send us into a panic mode, as it were, but to enable us to remain wise and harmless as God is being witnessed through us, but the same living God is building our characters to remain strong as we face the future. To me, this is how Apostle Paul had it. On his way to Rome, his last journey, uh, he appeared before Felix. Prior to this, he exercised wisdom and harmlessness, and being a harmless, rather. Each time he was challenged by a religious and a political system, he gave his conversion story. And we see using wisdom and being harmless when he was being, when allegations against him, most of them were not true, were being put to him to answer. He used a great challenge not to talk about how bad the Roman Empire was, how bad Nero was. In verse 25, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 24, verse 25, it says, Paul, and he reasoned of righteousness, of temperance, and judgment to come. Those three Biblical issues, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment of God. It says, Felix, sitting on his throne, trembled. And he answered, telling Paul, go your way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call thee, I will call you. Um, may God give us all a mindset that is not negative. Using an opportunity to highlight the beauty of the God we serve, being wise and harmless. Apostle Paul says he reasoned he used logic. He didn't, he didn't just go there and pray and then mouth in and anything. I could see righteousness, temperance, and judgment issues being God speaking through him around a wolf or wolves. And the wolves trembled. Can you, if there was a fight between sheep and uh, wolves, that wouldn't be a fair fight, would be, because wolves eat sheep. But God created both mammals. He's able, if he can shut the lion's mouth in the den, he can shut people's mouths 
in and anyhow. May God help me to have that mindset of being wise and harmless as we will be responding to this consultation. Uh, if you may have some challenges, please be in touch. We don't have all the answers, uh, but uh, let's see how we can help one another to put forward the views that may determine our future. But what is important is not to argue our way, but to reason, to use logic with the wisdom of God and using that wisdom to appeal to the powers that be. May God bless you. Thank you.